Okay, so um, in the last two weeks, um, one of the points that I've been trying to make to you, I guess, is to try to move away from the idea of what the ulama good, what the ulama bad, what the Islamic, what the non-Islamic. And these are not helpful paradigms in a way of understanding what I would say is the complexity of empire. Um, one of the points that I make, and Muslims maybe don't like the word empire because there is still a colonial baggage to the term. But actually the word empire in English also has a universal meaning, okay, in that sense. And so it's important to understand that when we talk about the Roman Empire or the Meiji Empire or the Qing Dynasty, um, we're not talking about the British and the French and their colonial like, activities. In that sense, the English medium doesn't have another word to describe the Ottoman Devlet. If you describe the Ottoman Devlet as the Ottoman state, that in itself is still not helpful in understanding its authority in places like Sana'a in Yemen or in Algeria. It doesn't make sense here. If you say domains, you could say domains, but still it's not helpful in explaining the governmental structure. So the idea is, is to understand that the Ottomans were an empire. And what that means, and the reason why I'm making this case, is because if we were to look at Wa'il Halak's idea of the modern state, and him making the argument that the 19th century was the introduction of modernity, and the idea of the impossibility of having a modern state, and the Ottomans are a reflection of that, empire, in this context, goes against the idea of the modern state. So whatever's happening in the modern empire, shall we say, um, is still not the same as the modern nation state. Empire cannot be nation state. It doesn't have the capacity to do that because its rules and parameters are different. Empire is something about plurality. Empire is about multi-ethnicity. Empire is about multiple landmass. And empire is about a particular form of power. So when we look at Russia, for example, and Russian extension into the Ukraine, that is empire. Okay, that's the extension of empire. And there is an assumption, or there has been an assumption, that we are always going to be within the framework of nation state. Well, what we're learning is that's not the case, that empire is still alive and kicking. The reason why the United States of America is the most successful state in the world is because it's not a nation state per se, it's an empire. So what you see is that the optimum model of governance, the idea of being at the top, it's not nation state. Nation state is quite restrictive. It's quite narrow. If you have ambitions of being a powerful state in the world, the idea is empire. The Americans know that. The Chinese know that. The Russians know that. The Europeans know that. But the Muslim world is afraid of this word because of the notions of coloniality and so forth. So what, the point I'm trying to help you understand here is that when the Ottomans have these imaginations of empire, they do have these in this sense. They're not looking at it in the colonial context. So then what we need is to look at uh, Sanjay Sabramanyam, who makes the argument, are all empires the same? All right? And this is the case across time and space. All right? And if we're making the argument that we do not want a nation state, for example, then the alternative is what? The alternative, the assumption, the argument is this decentralized zones. That never happens. Even in the 17th and 18th century, when the Ottoman domains are decentralized, there is a centralized authority in Istanbul, meaning it's an empire in some shape or form, right? What, that, what people like Subramaniam argue then is that empire is the natural configuration of human beings in the way they do governance. That naturally human beings who seek authority and power are going to move towards a model which includes something which resembles what we would call empire. Now the reason why I'm explaining this to you is to, I want you to understand the ulama in this context. Okay, that when we're looking at 19th century, the problem is, is when we use, and I said this before, words like modernity, secularism, Islamic, it doesn't make sense. So if I said to you, you know, I have friends who are part of particular movements and so forth, and they say we want an Islamic state. But what does that mean? What is, what is it that makes the state Islamic? And I know what they're doing because they're translating the Arabic to Dawla Islamiyah, right? But it doesn't work in English. It doesn't help to, to use those type of words to say, 
Islamic State. On the same token, Islamic law. What do we mean by Islamic law? What does that mean? We want Islamic law. We want the Sharia? Is it fiqh? What? And the point I'm trying to help you understand, I guess, is that even this terminology of saying Islamic law to some degree is problematic, okay? Because what it does is by speaking of Islam in these terms in of itself is restricting one's understanding of what Islam, how Islam operates in regards to the notion and the idea of an empire, which is the Ottomans. So once again, the, the point I'm trying to make here then is that the word Islamic law doesn't help, okay? So what am I saying then? I'm saying the word Islamic doesn't help. Yes, I've said this to you before that people ask me in the past that um, were the Ottomans Islamic? What are you asking me exactly? Are the Ottomans Islamic or not? What does that mean? So then I asked, are you asking me if the Ottomans were caliphate? Yes, that's what I'm asking you. Okay, well then, were the Ayyubids a caliphate? No. I, was Salah al-Din Islamic? Because, well, no, that's different. Fatih, was that a caliphate? No. Is Fatih Islamic? Yes, he's Islamic. Why is Fatih Islamic? But that's not what I mean. Are you asking me if they're Muslim? So what I'm saying here is now terminology and language matters. And one of the problems we have with Ottoman studies, especially regarding the ulama, is they are couched within a particular language and terminology, which is very difficult for us to escape from because we've become accustomed to Eurocentric um, terms that describe non-European societies. Subramaniam is interesting. He says, maybe we shouldn't call Europe, Western Europe, Europe. We should call it Eurasia. And maybe we shouldn't call the Middle East, Middle East, but we should call it Western, Western Asia, right? As a way of trying to help break this. So this is some of the points I'm deliberately trying to point to you because I want you to understand. People make the argument that because of the ulama's failure regarding Islam, that the Ottoman state collapsed. That doesn't make sense. I'll tell you why. They'll say they were not, if only the Muslims were more religious, if only the Muslims were more intellectual, if only the Muslims understood Islam properly, then we wouldn't have been in this situation. Then take 20 of your best ulama, the most pious ulama, the most intellectual ulama, the richest ulama, the smartest ulama, and put them in the ring with 20 MMA fighters. They're going to get smashed. They don't know how to fight. The simple reason why the Ottoman state collapsed is because militarily they didn't have the human forced to compete with the West. The population was 30 million of the whole Ottoman domains, from Cairo to Sarajevo to Yemen, a 30 million population. Of that population, we have men, yes, but then we have old men, children, women, and a civilian population that do not know or want to fight. So of that, how many men are soldiers? Less than half. And their job now is to protect the whole of the domains against the Russians, the British, the French, the Italians, the Greeks, it becomes difficult. Now, generally in today's world, what you start to see in the 19th century is the age of diplomacy. So what you do is you create diplomatic alliances with another nation so that you don't get stuck in this situation. Especially when in the 19th century we have a multipolar world, not a unipolar one, right, in that sense. The Ottomans had no alliances. All the other Muslim nations were colonized. They're stuck. What do they do now? It's not their fault that India was colonized by the British. How are they supposed to stop the Indians from being colonized? There's a nation called the Safavids and the Qajar dynasty in between them. So what I'm saying is people are not understanding correctly the realities. People will often say to me, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed, the Muslims didn't care about the caliphs, that's why they didn't move. It doesn't make sense, Yanni. You're expecting civilians to start going crazy in the countries they're in? It doesn't work like that. Aqsa has been occupied, since I can imagine. Why are the Muslims not moving? Ukraine is at war. Why are the West people not going to Ukraine to fight? People don't mobilize like this. When the Umayyads were catapulted in Mecca, nobody moved. When the Crusaders came, nobody moved. The expectation that human beings are going to mass mobilize in this way, because a symbol of Islam is under attack, is not realistic because there's no historical precedent for this. Human beings mobilize on a local level. 
It requires local people who have the authority and the capacity to mobilize those people to die for something. A regular man is not going to want to die. He's, got, he's married, he's got kids, he's got children. Look at the war in Syria. When the Syrians come here, the Turks keep telling them, why are you here? Go back. Why are you not fighting? It doesn't make sense. Because if the same thing happened in this country, people will be running to Europe. So what happens? Look at the Ukrainians. So the point I'm trying to make to you is that this is not an issue of the failure of Islam or the failure of the ulama. This is a way of understanding the complexities of human society. Okay? It's unreasonable to ex expect a regular person who's a Muslim, who's married and got four kids, to die for the devlet. It's just not fair to expect that from them. And it's unreasonable to expect that an alim also has the same capacity and uh, ability as the military soldier. He doesn't. So until you start to understand the nature of power and the ulama's place within the Ottoman state structure, their place was to some degree about educating society, but they had no control over World War I. What could they do? So I, I, I'm deliberately saying this, maybe there's a sense of frustration in my voice today, and I apologize for that. But I'm tired, I'm really tired of trying to explain this to Muslims continuously, you know. Um, it's, the example I gave is when I have Muslim friends who come to Turkey in Ramadan, and they say the Turks, oh, they don't fast in Ramadan. I say, what do you mean they don't fast in Ramadan? I was in Taksim and everyone's eating. Can you see people fasting? What are you looking for? Fasting is a non-action. Maybe that Amja who's walking down the street is fasting. You can't see it. He's not wearing a label on his head, I'm fasting today. So then my friends would reply, but all the shops should be closed. It's Ramadan. If all the shops are closed, so be it. So what they're looking for is they want something visible and evident. It has to be very clear for them to have any understanding of it. But real life, and as historians, things are not that clear. As a historian then, you have to be able to see the invisible. That's the harder part, because one of the things that Western academia has done, and it's very sloppy here, is most Western academics only write about the Muslim scholars who wrote. So because Muhammad Abdul wrote, it's easy to get hold of Muhammad Abdul's ideas. He wrote it down. But some ulama didn't write. They didn't need to write. They went into a jami, gave a Jummah khutbah, rocked the house, and left. That's it. Where's the evidence for that? How can I find it? So there is a methodological problem, which is a tendency of leaning on written accounts as a way of indicating proof of something. So as a historian, then, you have to get smarter. Women in the Ottoman Empire, it's not that they didn't exist. They did, of course they existed. But most women chose to be invisible, either because they preferred that way of life or because that's just the way the, the way of life was at the time. I was writing about Young Turk Revolution. You never read about women in the Young Turk Revolution. But they were there, because I've seen them in the British records. When you need a spy, who are you going to use? A child or a woman? Soldiers are not going to stop the woman from coming through. And they would take messages and say, Flan Flan is over here. Off you go. Men would dress as women and go out to give messages. So women were involved in these revolutionary activities, but once again, they're invisible because this is a moment in history where vis invisibility, to some degree, was, was important. I mean, one could argue that one of the reasons why many women now take off their hijab is because they want to be invisible. Because invisibility still matters. Not everybody wants to be visible and seen. They want to be what is perceived as being normal, right? Once you stand out, it becomes a problem in that sense. So I'm just trying to help you understand the, the, the context of the Ottoman world at the time. So what is happening? in this sense then. One of the things that we see then is that we have a, um, an idea of modernity or codification is what's actually taking place, the idea of codification. And codification is a global phenomena. And the reason why codification is happening is because state bureaucracies are becoming far more efficient. The objective of codification, sorry, let me just read my notes because I wrote this down, is one, because the new elites, the new educated elites, wanted a more efficient state system. Okay? So the idea of having an efficient bureaucracy is, sorry, you don't have the manpower for it. So you start to create laws which are easy to understand. The second thing is, is um, the centralizing nature of rulers. 
The rulers were centralizing their domains because they were concerned about things like nationalism. Now, people are not loyal to this um, entity. There's rebellions. The people are feeling disconnected from one another. In the past, that level of plurality would have been OK, but by the 19th century, that becomes harder to do, especially because of the rise of nationalism. Once again, the Ottomans can't control nationalism. Nationalism is a Eurocentric construct. It starts to happen in Europe, and then they export it to other countries when they create in the nation states. And now, in the Ottoman domains, especially in the Balkans, where you're starting to see a rise of nationalism, how do you counter that? So you have to have a state machinery that can counter that. So you create an idea called Ottomanism, right? in that sense, as a form of patriotism. And the last thing is, is as literacy was increasing amongst society, they want, people wanted a clarity in law. Regular people started to take an interest in law. Regular people. What does this mean? What does that mean? What about this law? What about, explain it to me. In the past, people didn't care. But as the literacy is increasing, there is an increase in wanting to know about law. So what you start to see is a global codification movement around the world as states are trying to become efficient. Now, people say that the Ottomans should not have modernized. So let's look at this argument then. If they didn't modernize, the British create trains, steamships, weapons, printing press, this type of technology. You're just going to do nothing because with that technology came modernization. You're just going to say, we're going to leave that tech alone. You, you can't do that. So then you have to do something. So Japan modernizes. China's modernizing. The Americas are modernizing. So in that sense, you, you can see that the Ottomans they, they don't have much of a choice in regards to the way that the technology is making the other states more efficient. Okay, so it's because of this efficiency you have to make a choice. So you either do something or you don't do something. If you don't do something, you get left behind. And if you do something, you're accused of being like the people that you're criticizing. The point I'm trying to make to you here is that what the Ottomans were trying to do was they were trying to do something a little bit more indigenous. They understood that this technology, this centralization, they knew the problems with it, but they tried to find a balance. How can we find a balance with this? How can we make it work? It's not just the Ottomans that are doing this. I'm seeing this in my own work. The Japanese are doing the same. In Meiji, Japan, they're looking at Western modernization, and they were saying, that's not for our culture. That's not for our tradition. We don't want that. But this, this, and this, that can work. China is exactly the same. The Chinese are looking. The British are coming. And they're thinking, how are the Chinese improving so I mean, the British improving so quickly? It's tech. So they're looking, and so forth. It's even now, you know, um, <coughs> with the Bayraktar drones. Should the Turks have never made those drones? It doesn't make sense. The world is making drones. So you either become an importer of drones or you don't. But if you want to compete as a state, technology, you're going to have to make adjustments to your technological advancements in that sense. This is just the way the world functions in that sense, right? So as the world is changing around it, and as the state is becoming more efficient internally, it's only natural that you start to see movements towards codification. And the reason why codification is possible is because of the printing technology. Right? The more you can produce text quick and fast, written text, the easier it becomes to codify. And because you don't have time to educate an alim for 15, 20 years, it's easier just to put it in a book and give it to someone who's an undergrad and say, off you go. Just... And basically, that's what the Majelle was in some ways. It was just like, you natives over here who are not qualified, trained alims, you're young freshmen. Okay, we'll get you in the courts quickly. And you've got a book, and you can read off it. And you're not doing anything heavy. It's just civil matters. Yeah, and we move on. The serious matters, it still has to go to the top end, right? In that sense. So what we see in 1840 is the codification of criminal law. In the 1850s, commerce law. And then 1869, but mainly in 1879, the Nizamiya courts. Okay? What this, the reason why these courts emerge is because to some degree, the Ottomans have to amalgamate non-Muslims into the Ottoman state structure. 
Okay? So we need to make non-Muslims feel part of this state machinery. Whereas in the past, we would have Muslim courts and non-Muslim courts, and non-Muslims had the capacity to go to their own courts or come to the Sharia courts, that's not possible anymore because non-Muslims in of themselves are interacting with the West. Okay? So it's intriguing how modernity comes into the Ottoman domains. One is via the central government. Two is via encroaching colonialism. Three is non-Muslims themselves who have the capacity to go to the West and come back. So imagine, like, I'm an Armenian who goes to France, comes back, and the Muslims go, wow, that's amazing, what's he doing? How come we're not doing that? Then the devil is like a bit confused now. What do we do? How do we make this adjustment? So modernity is coming in different shapes and forms in different ways. But modernity, as I told you two weeks ago, is a history of the urbanized city centers. Modernity is not a history of Mecca, Medina, Diyarbakir, Adana. Modernity is a history of Istanbul, Paris, London. So it's still giving you a skewed understanding of how empire operates. Okay, the complexity of this, this devlet in this sense. But what is interesting is some historians of law will make the argument that this type of codification is a move away from the traditional ways of doing Islamic law. Right? This is the argument they put in. Other historians like Guy Burak and Sami Ayyub are making the argument, that, hang on a minute, maybe we see forms of codification in the 17th and 18th century too. It's just a different type of codification. So the argument here is interesting. We could argue that this is not a debate about secularism and Islam. This is an argumentation of how the printing press, written text, was forcing the changing of the way we did Islam because of the possibility of now producing text very quickly. Whereas in the past, you'd have written books, written by hand, now it's just stamp, stamp, next, bang, bang, next. It changes everything. It can make things a lot faster in that sense. And now that you can print Quran so quickly, for example, or you can print fiqh books so quickly, you can take these manuals into schools a lot faster. Whereas in the past, that wouldn't have been the case. So printing press is not just the printing tech, it's paper revolution, because we didn't have paper before that as well in this way. It changes a lot of things in the way that we did fiqh. So this maybe could be a contestation between oral tradition and written tradition. And now that we have the printed press, the, the, the authority of the written text is far greater than the oral text or the oral speech in this way, right? So what we see then is military reforms forces educational reforms, which forces legal reforms to try to make the state more efficient. And as a result, you can see the ulama are now being impacted in all of these spheres, okay, in this context. And so the ulama are then directly impacted by this. Now what's interesting is um, when people talk about the bureaucratization of the Ottoman state, one of the things that they always talk about is the, the laws that we can read, but they don't take into consideration that there are still local customs that are still taking place, that haven't changed. That practices in local... So I give an example. Um, uh, in the Albanian provinces, one of the interesting things is, is that um, when there was violence against women, women found it very difficult to... Uh, and whatnot. So there was a woman who went through a particular form of violence. She was killed by a person who claimed to be her husband. He went to the court and he said, no, no Muslim saw me do this. Okay? No Muslim saw me do this, so I haven't committed a crime here. And then the Ottoman said, in accordance to the new laws of the Kanun, a Muslim doesn't need to see you do this. Non-Muslims saw you do this. And we can bring them into the court and take their testimony to say, did you commit this crime or not? And you did. So you can see the shift that's taking place. The guy was trying to invoke his Sharia position in regards to the Sharia courts. Another interesting thing was, one of, um, there was a woman who was, um, who, was, who was murdered by a particular guy. And so what they did in Albania is her family's house, they burnt it down. It's interesting. <laughs> and so the house of the family, the people's house who got burnt down, they complained to Abdul Hamid II. And the Padishah then turns around and goes, what are you doing? You can't burn down people's houses. Like, what are you, you're taking the law. And then the argument they made is in accordance to the customs of this area, this is acceptable. 
And because the intriguing thing is, is that in Islamic law, unlike in European law, if you commit a crime, like if I kill someone, then my family has to play the bad money to that family. The families get involved. The idea of the families getting involved is the idea is a, is a check mechanism on me to make sure that I don't commit a crime of that nature. Because it's not just me who's committed the crime, it's my whole family who are accountable for this. And it's a shame culture, and so on. And so in the Albanian provinces, if you killed someone, the local custom was, in some of the places, to burn down their house as a way of teaching them a lesson. And they say, Abdul Hamid is saying, you can't do that anymore. And the people are saying, this is a local custom. Now, the point I'm making here is that the fact that they could have that debate with the Sultan is an indication that local custom still had weight. There's a negotiation taking place regarding this type of practice. Now, we might not like the practice, but that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making here is what you're seeing in empire is there is a codification of modern law, but there's still a retaining of traditional forms of legal st structures and justice. It still exists. This is the complexity of empire. And the ulama understood this. So the point I'm making once again is, is try to highlight to you that the idea that the ulama are just all reforming and changing is not necessarily what's taking place. There's a huge negotiation. What the 19th century Ottoman state is, it's a hybrid. And it has to be understood in that way. It cannot be a modern nation state. Because empire cannot be modern nation state in that sense, right? In that sense. Um, so, right. So the point that I was trying to make then is that for these new legal structures, we have different types of terminology. We have sharia, fiqh, kanun, hukuk. And I remember two weeks ago, one of the girls, she's not here today, unfortunately, she asked me, Hojam, what is sharia? And I said, that's the million dollar question. She thought that that was a stupid question to ask, but it wasn't. Because people don't know. Even people who are educated don't know. When you ask them, okay, well, what does that mean? When we say the Sharia courts, these are the Sharia courts, what do we mean by it when we say these are the Sharia courts and those are the secular courts? What are we talking about? Right? And so, well, you know, I've been going through so many books. What's, the, what's a good definition to describe what Sharia means? Because if I said to you that Sharia is Islamic law, that doesn't make sense because in, according to Sharia, you should eat with your right hand. What's that got to do with law? You know, Sharia says be good to your wife. Sharia says be good to your family. Sharia says how to pray, how to fast. Matters of ibadat, matters of muamalat. Like how do you make sense of this? It's, you can't just say it's law. You, that's hudud, but that's a penal code. That in itself is different. So what is the Sharia, right? And then the practice, the fiqh, in the way that you, you practice, in the, how, how can I say this? I, I wrote this down. It's, um, let me check in my notes, because I, I thought my, my thinking this morning was better than. So I wrote that the Sharia is divinely pre prescribed path of right conduct. That's what I came with. I didn't want to call it law, per se. But does it influence law? Yes. Does it have parts within it which are law? Of course it does. Of course it does. Fiqh is... Um, is the jurisprudential scholarship that allows debate regarding difference of this sharia, of which law could be a part of it. Okay? Siyasa is the mutable law, and fiqh is the immutable law, meaning siyasa is malleable. And a lot of people don't understand siyasa. They, everything is Sharia orientated because of their conception of Sharia. They don't understand that siyasa or siyaset, the, the way that it functions, is a part of the way that legal theory functioned. We don't apply that anymore, but that was there for a particular reason. So the point I'm trying to make to you is in the 19th century, you're starting to see um, the state itself or the center getting involved in more and more of legal matters, right? And this is what's making it difficult for the ulama. I think this is the complaint in Turkey, that the devlet itself is getting involved in lawmaking structures. But what you're actually seeing, or what I think is happening, is just like the non-Muslims are losing their independence, because non-Muslims are turning to modernity and a form of positivism, 
that what the devlet is doing is it's trying to create a universal positivist law that can apply to everybody. And here, positivism is not secular because Islam has always maintained positive, positivist lawmaking. This is why Dr. Sherman Jackson, he found it difficult. He had to call it the Islamic secular. In essence, you don't need a word for it. But in essence, in now, we need a word for it because we're academics. We're trying to make sense of that positivist aspect of law. There is an assumption that positivism is only a modern phenomenon. It's not. It's always existed in Islamic law. Siyasa is an example of that. Kanun is an example of that. Okay? But what they did is they put Siyasa and Kanun under the framework of Islam. What seems to be happening in the Ottoman period is a negotiation, a natural negotiation of trying to place positivism under the rubrics of Islam. Now some people argue that by doing that, that's the secularization of the Islamic. That that's what they're doing. Other people can argue that's the Islamization attempt of the secular. And this comes down to how you see history in reality, right? But this contestation between positivism and that which is seen as Islamic has always been there. To some degree, constitutional theory, you could argue, is a form of an Islamic imposition to try to take positive law, positivist lawmaking regarding the executive and trying to put it under the rubrics of Islam. So what's happening in some ways, is you're seeing an amalgamation of trying to create a secular law, which is actually under Islam, to try to deal with all of these problems in one go. What the Ottomans are doing then, which is strange, and this is the, the, they're actually trying to Islamize secular lawmaking. They can't deny secular lawmaking. It's there, it's natural, because the world is becoming like that. What they're trying to do is put it under the rubrics of Islam. Now, what historians of the secularization of the Ottoman state said is they argued that this was just sugarcoating. This was just on the surface. This was just an instrumentalization. But it's difficult to know because the empire collapses very quickly. If given more time, if given more time, who knows how this law could have evolved and developed okay, in that context. So the interesting thing here is, is to look at it in this context. And this is, I guess what I'm trying to explain to you is that there is a blurring taking place. And one of the interesting things is there is an institutionalization taking place. And institutionalism is anti-communalism, right? When you create an institution, by and large, the opinion of communals within the institution don't become important anymore. The institution have laws, they have rules, this is the, the way we do it, and so forth. It becomes devoid of emotion, devoid of spirituality, distinct from that. The in, that it's interesting because in Muslim countries we always want to build institutions. We're obsessed with it. But what the Ottomans were doing was not only were they building institutions, they then wanted to put the ulama in the institutions because that's the communal aspect. Okay? The communal aspect of these institutions is to have people of religion and emotion and spirit in it so that it maintains the communal component. What I'm arguing now, and we'll talk about this next week, is that if you remove the ulama, is that secularization? Can you have Islamic law without the ulama? Can you have Sharia courts without the ulama? Can you have an Islamic society without them? If we're making the argument that the removal of so many of these components is a secularization, what about the human agents themselves? If you remove the human agents, what do you have? One of the natural things about societies is you require those human agents. You need them to be there. They are the glue, they are the human component. They are the emotional component of that law. If you just look at law proper, the thick books, it's just thick books. It makes no sense. It requires a human agent to be able to execute that law and to provide the emotional intelligence to it. In that sense, my argument is, is Allah Ta'ala, when he created insan, emotion was a natural disposition of insan. The Quran is an emotional book. Of course it is. Allah Ta'ala knows what he's created. In that sense, I argue, that religious societies are emotional societies. And the Ottoman devlet was an emotional devlet because of this meta-institution who were the ulama. And while 
It may be true that in certain fact, factors regarding law itself that you might be seeing some sort of practices taking place that you might find as being a secularization. But so long as the people were there, the human agents were there, they were a reflection of that metaculture, that paradigm. And so long as they were there, the human and emotional and religious component would always be there. It's only when you take those human beings out do, now the, in, do, do the institutions now look devoid of any Islam. So if Turkey tomorrow opened up all these Sharia courts all over the country, but there's no ulama in the Sharia courts, then what does that mean exactly? It means you have an institution that has religion in it, but I would argue it's devoid of that communal component of what the religion represents. So people can argue that that's what the ilahiyat was supposed to be. The ilahiyat, unlike the madrasa, the madrasa is not a building or curricula. People are obsessed with the curricula. What is the curricula? What are they teaching? They forget that the institution in Islam is the person himself or herself. It's a human being. Did they embody Islam in the way it should be understood? And so you need an institution or a building that has these types of people in it. Because they are a connection between Allah and society, Allah and the state, Allah and the Akhirah. That's the idea. That's why the ulama are very unique institution, meta institution in that sense, that are beyond just the buildings and the structures and, and the things that you're created. So what I'm arguing here is that in the 19th century, and why I was talking about the ulama in modernity, is that what people do is they look at the transformation of law. They look at the transformation of education. They look at the transformation of the legal structure. They don't look at the people themselves. The people are devoid from that. And it's strange because if you look at these legal practitioners, these education, these, these teachers, these journalists, when you read their other works about tasawwuf, about ibadat, about falsafa, it's impossible to assume that this embodiment of this character is devoid in the other things that they're practicing. Right? That makes sense. Yeah. Anybody will tell you. Yaakob Poja is from Sawas, Western Muslim, flan, flan, flan. He teaches these, these, these subjects. But you know what? The guy is a religious guy. When we speak to him, he, he's pumping Islam into us when he's speaking to us. Now, if you read my text, you won't see that in my text. When I write articles, you don't see my religiosity in my articles. But anyone who meets me knows that it's there. Now, what I'm saying to you, however, is that I do see it in the ulama. It's there, but in their other works. Okay, so don't... What I'm saying is, when we're looking at the ulama of the 19th century, don't just look at legal history. Look at these people and see what else they were doing. Were they part of tariqats? Were they practitioners of tasawwuf? Were they religious? Were they teaching? Were they writing books on ilm? Were they writing books on family matters? Were they writing books on fasting? If you see this, you start to realize that you have to look at it in its totality, right? In this sense. And this is, I think, really missing. And one of the points I really want to push home, and I hope this happens, where we need more biographies of ulama of the Ottoman period. More biographies, because what we have is very lazy. We have some sloppy biographies of only a few. And the biographies that we read of them are just their works. This guy published these works. This is this, this is this, this is this. There's nothing human about that, okay, in that context. There's nothing that, that connects that in that context. And the pedagogy of Islam is very simple, huh? Allah Ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salam as a teacher to Rasul Sallam. And he taught him. And Rasul Sallam was a teacher to mankind. And the ulama who continue this methodology are teachers in that sense. They're supposed to continue this. This is what makes Muslim societies different. In the period of Abdul Hamid II, scholars from Japan came to Istanbul, from China, from Europe. Of course they did. And the different states were looking at each other. So it's not just them looking at Europe. They're all looking at each other. What's interesting about the Ottoman domains is they sent ulama. So when I look at China, they sent legal experts. And, China, and Japan, they sent legal practitioners in Europe and so forth. But Istanbul was sending religious people to Malaysia, to China, to Japan, to Europe. This tells you something about the mindset of this devlet, that it is different. It's a different devlet in the way it operates. So one of the points I want to highlight again, because people don't like this in Western academia, and even in Turkey they get upset, 
It's like, you know, you're, you're trying to push an Islamic exceptionalism. Of course I am. I'm not hiding that. Islam is different. Like, of course it's different. The point I'm making is that, yes, there are many things regarding Islam that are common with other parts of the world. But if you remove its exceptionalism or its exceptional component, then what is Islam? It means nothing now. How is it different? It makes no sense. It has to be different for it to make sense to Muslims in that context. And what I'm saying is in the academic works, they're taking the exceptionalism out of it by trying to you know, you know, flatten it out to make it all the same. If you look at it like that, then you're not going to understand the unique components of the ulama and Islam in the late Ottoman period. Okay? This doesn't make sense here. So you have to, I've been accused of this a lot in, in Western academia, which I make no apologies for, by the way. But if people critique me as being you know, an Islamist and so forth, which I'm not, or well, it depends on what you categorize, whatever. But the point I'm making is that they come after me with a slur. And I have to then show them, I say, wait, hang on a minute. But did they not do this? And did they not do that? And did they not do that? And they will say, you're looking at the Islam of that time from the way you want to see it. I say, no, you're looking at the Islam from the way you want to see it. Because the, I'm not trying to Islamize the secular again. What I'm saying is it's complicated. I want you to see the complexity. And what's happening in the way that we write and create typologies is we remove the complexity. We have to have clear distinctions. It is true that there can be clear distinctions at times, but it's, it's really blurry, huh? It's, you, you need to understand that, that we don't put people in boxes. This is one of the problems I've always had in Turkey when I've come here. People want to put you in a box. And the most dangerous box is the person who doesn't fit in the box. Because that person doesn't make sense at all, right? That's the, the issue here. But life is not like that. People are... So you look at ulama, why did they make their decisions? Some ulama made decisions because they were emotional. Some ulama made the decisions because as they got older, their opinions change. I always get frustrated when people say, oh, Imam Shafi gave this, you know, this position here. Yeah, but he was 28 then. What about when he was 40? They don't look at it like that. So Yusuf Akhtar, oh, amazing. Yusuf Akhtar was 28 when he wrote his book. If a 28-year-old wrote a book today, nobody would take it seriously. 28 years old, he wrote a book about Ottomanism, Islamism, and Turkification. It became popularized by the theorists of modernization. At that time, nobody cared. Nobody cared that a 28-year-old wrote a book about these things. Because who were important then? The ulama. They wouldn't have cared that somebody wrote a book. If I was 28 and I wrote a book about Turkish politics, nobody in Turkey would take me seriously. They'd be doing their own thing. But this written document, because it was written, and a scholar had the capacity to pick up this book and then think, hmm, that's probably what happened. And then popularized it. It became part of the discourse, right? In this sense. Now, I did say that I was going to talk about... Oh, I have five minutes. I've gone off topic. Uh, my apologies. I'm just in a bad mood. Life is not good to me. All right. The point I'm trying to make to you then is rather than looking at the Ottomans as a, as a point of separation, it's important to understand the moments of integration. Rather than looking at the, um, rather than looking at, um, the history of um, winners and losers, it's better to look at history for, of empires of gains and losses. Here, when Russia has invaded Ukraine, there's no winners or losers here. There's gains and losses. The Russians will gain on the fact that they have taken some parts of Ukraine, which are important to them. They will present it as an internal victory for them. There is a red line, and that's a gain for them. The losses for them is that public opinion globally has impacted them heavily. They've lost many soldiers, and so forth, and they're being sanctioned. The gains for the United States of America, it never had any intention of Ukraine being part of NATO. That's why it was non-committed. But Germany became militarized. Germany is far more important than Ukraine. That's the NATO power they want militarized. That's a gain here. Ukraine is the loss, right? And what I'm trying to explain to you is how empires operate. Empires operate like this. And the reason why I'm saying this is because the Ottomans were an empire. And so when you're looking at that complexity of that history, you need to look at it like that. This linear reading of it, it doesn't help, especially regarding the ulama. In, um, 
1807, we have the Hujjat al-Sharia, okay, which is the first document we see, which is a way of trying to compromise the authority of the Sultan. And then as a response to that, when the Janissaries are sort of like defeated by um, Alim Dar Pasha, comes down from Bulgaria, we have the Senate Ittifaq, another document of explaining the Sultan's authority and the configuration of the Ottoman domains regarding the Ayan. And then in 1839, we have the Gulhane Edict. And every one of these edicts has the ulama involved. And then we have the Kanun Esasi in 1876, where the debate is taking place whether we should have a constitution or not have a constitution. And then in 1909, the debate is not whether we should have a constitution or not have a constitution. The debate is what type of constitution, a conservative constitution or a liberal constitution. Discursively, see how this is changing. The ulama are involved in all of these moments. It's not a moment of going up or going down. It's a moment, what I'm trying to highlight, is they're always there, available. They're part of the state machinery. And amongst them, there are humongous debates all the time. In every one of these documents, you can see to and fro, backwards and forwards, continuously, about how political authority should look like. Um, there are many Turkish academics now who are making the argument that the Ottomans had constitutional traditions prior to the 19th century. They already had this. This is not new. Right? Um, but then people say, well, why did they have to have a constitution? Well, why not? Why can they not be like Britain? They could be. They had that debate. Should we not be like the United Kingdom? What's interesting is the Ottoman did the, um, the civil codes in, 18, in the 1850s. The Germans, Germans didn't do it until 1896, very late. And the British decided they didn't want to do it. So what you're seeing is, it's not that the Ottomans are then following the British. I mean, in some ways, the Ottomans were doing certain things that the British and the Germans and the French hadn't done yet. It's because it was tailored to their needs of the devlet. We're going to go into World War I next week, but just very quickly so you can understand what's happening next week, right? For the Ottomans to be able to um, efficiently survive against the Western powers, they needed money. The reason why you need money is because you need to build schools so that you can educate your society that can understand the new conditions. You, have, you can tax people, but the ulama complained. You can take money, force money off them, but then society complained. Or you can borrow money from the West. So they went for the easier option because they don't want to upset their society and they don't want to excessively tax their society. So they went for an option, which is what other option do we have? We'll just take money from the West. What did the West do though? They were stealing. They were colonizing. The Ottomans couldn't do that. Islam would never allow them to do that. So you're, imagine how you're competing. You're competing with two, some entities who can steal and pillage and take. You can't do that to your population. But you need to modernize to be able to compete with them. How do you do that? So then you have to borrow because you can't take from your own people. Like me, I'm working in Ilahiyat right now. My students want to go on a school trip. They don't have the money. What do I do? Wazichi University, they're taking their students and blah, 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 you know. Other universities taking their kids to Chanakale. We don't have the money, what do we do? Do I then say to the students, no, you're going to all have to pay? We can't, Hojam. Okay, shall I go to the, the Deccan and steal the money? I can't do that either, right? So we have to find another way. So maybe what I might have to do is go to one of these other institutions and say, can you lend me some money? It sounds outrageous, but the point I'm trying to help you understand is, is the binder in, this complexity. It's not like the ulama was selling out. It, 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 this is hard choices in a difficult world. And so these are some of the choices they're making. It's because of this period, we then see the emergence of Naqshbandis as a political force. We see the emergence of Salafism as a political force. We see the emergence of Wahhabism as a political force, because printed press technology allows the visibility of your ideology that can be propagated to other parts of the world. If it wasn't for modernity, you wouldn't have Salafism or Wahhabism today. So as much as they critique that, but that form of modernity gave them the agency to exist to some degree. The printed press gave them that. right? So in this sense, the point I'm making is I don't think you can escape modernity. right? The, the Muslims, when Islam came to the Arabian Peninsula, the Muslims didn't escape pre-Arabian culture. It was still, the residue of it was still there. When the Mongols invaded, 
The residue of Mongol culture is still in the Ottomans. If you want to decolonize modernity, it's impossible. The residue of it will still be here. The question is, how do you negotiate what you want and what you don't want, right? In that sense. So today, what I was trying to highlight to you is just, I want you to try to understand more in regards to, you can't understand the ulama if you don't understand the complexities of the 19th, 20th century of how the empire is, right? And I feel like people have a very infantile understanding of empire. And it's because the media in the West in particular is, it treats people like they're infants in the way that it gives them news. So like the war in Ukraine is Russian bad, America good. It's the same as Islamic terrorism, Muslims bad, America good. I'm not saying the Russians are good. What I'm saying is the complexity is missing. The complexity is missing is what about Britain? What about France? What about Russia? What about Ukraine? What about America? Give the complexity. And for us as historians, one of the things we learn in regards to being intellectuals, and this is why I'm upset that history is not taught as curricular, is because good historians, they understand complexity. What Muslims have fallen onto is theory, civilizational theory, Ibn Khaldunian theory. Theory doesn't tell you the details. So this is why Muslims like civilizational theories. We go up, we go down, we're this and that. We're going to mix like this, uniplex, multiplex, falan, falan, falan. But, but in reality, it has no meaning. But what's happening on the day to day, right, is because they don't study the nature of human beings, the, the nature of conflict, the nature of violence. You need to have a mature understanding of what violence is. Violence is a reality, it's not going anywhere. Understand that. The ulama understood that. This is why when my friend Salman Said says that truth needs to speak power, power needs to speak truth. I said, it doesn't make sense. The ulama knew this. That's why they spoke truth to power. Because it's, un, it's, it's unrealistic, it's idealistic to assume that power will always speak truth. Because power can be corrupted. You need an institution that can speak truth to power, continuously reminding them. That's why you have them there. These ideals, and Muslims continuously are seeing the present and the past through ideals. If we just have good ethics, if we just have good morality, what about the violence? It's going to be there. It's the nature of human beings. What about expansion? What about finite resources? What about these, these things, right? And so as a historian, and what I'm trying to push for you guys, because I don't think I'm going to be doing this long, is I want history to be part of the curricula. People keep saying to me, Hojam, do you have a book I can read on Ottoman history? That it makes me so mad. Because it's like saying, do you have a book on Sharia? Do you have a book on Hanafi fiqh? This is 600 years of empire. And you want one book to just give you all the answers? We're not teaching you history so that you just know what happened in the past. We're trying to shape the way you think. The idea of studying history and why it should be in the, in the curricula is to shape the way you think, to understand the nature of human beings, to understand the complexity of power, to understand how the is Islam operates in these societies, what happened, and so on, right? And once you understand that, then you can have a more realistic expectation of the now in terms of the way you live right now. And you understand yourself better in the world you live in because you understood the past better. And if you understood the past better, then only then can you have a better understanding of what you want in the future. Otherwise, everything's just going to be this dream, ideal, imagination, which has no reality. And this is what concerns me in that sense. And this is why... I'm trying to press home with this, with the ulama. I'm not going to be writing more on the ulama because I'm moving away from them. But I, I learned something about them, which is that we don't understand what they do. We think that these are just people that give us fatwas and, and we pray. But in actuality, what we see is that it's an institution whose existence needs to be there because it has multiple layers to it, right, in that sense.